Um, so um, it's nice that I have a chance as a nurse to uh, do a little presentation. Um, so um, we're, I'm going to present on a girl from our own clinic whose name is Kelly. Um, and uh, she had a really horrific uh, experience in her delivery years. So she's a known type 2B, um, as you see, and with her baseline levels, fairly typical of 2B. And um, this is how we sort of started. Then um, she had two really near-death experiences with her um, deliveries. The first one was, and you may wonder why, hopefully it will be clear why we're I'm doing these, this case that's quite old. Um, anyways, this, in 1993, with her second pre pregnancy, um, she ended up coming to the DR, the ER. They did a D, no factor was given at the time. I guess uh, maybe it was because it was 1993. Um, and the uh, OB-GYN physicians decided to do a, do a DNC with no factor on board. And she was sent home with um, tranexamic acid by mouth. A week later, she came in with a major vaginal hemorrhage and was very unstable in the eMERGE. And as you see, her hemoglobin had dropped to uh, 86. At that time, um, she was given Humate P uh, for over uh, four doses, I guess, and uh, then needed to receive two units of packed cells and spent eight days actually in the hospital and, and went home on tranexamic acid for uh, the next uh, 14 days. Um, what happened in 1995 was the one I remember specifically as an ER nurse because I was there. And um, Kelly had, been, had had no period for eight months. And then her husband found her um, on the bathroom floor with blood and clots everywhere, uh, panicked, I think phoned probably Dr. Lillicrap's office, phoned emerged, they brought her in, and uh, she really had no vital signs when she arrived in uh, our emerge. Um, so it was a pretty very, very scary circumstance. Um, eventually, she did have a blood pressure um, of 86 over 50, and uh, but her heart rate was still up, so she was obviously still continuing to lose blood. And um, what happened was um, I uh, started her IV of saline and then ran down to the uh, blood bank to start mixing up Humate P. In the meantime, my colleague, um, sort of jumped into action. And um, she, uh, her name's Gigi, and we'll see. Actually, I think I need to go back here to just show that. I um, um, don't know if I'm missing the picture of, of Gigi, but anyhow, she's the, my colleague that just went out and there was a gynae physician sitting there uh, ready to, to see another patient and she grabbed him and threw him in the room because everything was being soaked through in the bed and she said, you just have to do something. So hence, uh, we have our, uh, this is where she takes her action, and hence we have the two things that really made the difference in uh, Kelly's case, was the humate, um, but particularly prior to that, because badge packing wasn't working, so the, emerge, the uh, gynae resident grabbed the biggest uh, catheter that we had in the department, and uh, then it was blown up, put up into her cervix, and between that and more packing and the humate, we see that Kelly was able to go home uh, the very next day, which was amazing considering the way she arrived in our department. Now, someone else had a near-death experience who was Dr. Lillicrap because Kelly, I think her husband had been through so much, like two major postpartum bleeds with his wife, and he went down, found Dr. Lillicrap's office, and grabbed him about the throat and tried to strangle him. But um, he wasn't successful, as we see, because he's still here. And um, it, it was not a great experience for him, but uh, it was a very overwrought husband. Anyway, uh, Kelly opted, uh, not surprisingly, for a hysterectomy, which she had two months later. There's uh, Kelly there, as you see, in, uh, and Gigi is my uh, very favorite o uh, ER colleague um, that's with her. And I just wanted to, sh the reason to show this was particularly because things have, um, change. First of all, it, it does describe how life-threatening a postpartum bleed can be, but some of the changes um, that have come about are the, the fact that our ob gynae physician, which we are lucky to have a women's clinic in Kingston, but an ob gynae physician I don't believe would ever let a woman be amenorrheic and not have a period for eight months. 
um, because of this very possibility. So that's uh, some progress. Um, we have some ER room changes and uh, we've, we've uh, changed our level. At one point when I was first working in emergency and for many, many years, up until this came about, I think, or not until about 2008, was our triage. We, had, we didn't have bleeding disorders mentioned at all, you know, on that whole list. So things have changed and so any, um, anyone that comes in with uh, bleeding, whether it's hemophilia or von Willebrand disease, if it's severe, they're automatically put in an emergent category um, at a level two and, um, and everyone else is considered a level three. So hopefully you're not gonna have to wait for hours and hours for any patients like uh, sometimes does happen. Um, the fact of first card, I actually brought some with me if anybody wants to see them come to me afterwards. Um, they really are the, one of the best things that have come about and it was thanks to um, so an emergency committee that had uh, one of the eMERGE physicians um, from Edmonton on that committee who sort of with, uh, with through his organization was able to push to have um, things changed along with the hematologist input. And so these cards actually open up and inside you'll see an individualized um, uh, uh, list of what to do and it's very helpful for our, our emerge physicians that I work with. Um, it gives what to do for a severe, serious um, major bleed. I don't know if I have that um, to show on the inside. Um, no, I guess not, but anyways, on the inside, uh, on the inside cover is the name of our uh, clinic and how to call uh, someone in the case of an emergency, and then on the right side of the card, it shows a uh, major bleed, exactly how much humate they would require, and for a moderate bleed, whether they're desmopressin responsive and whether you can give them desmopressin, um, and tranexamic acid is listed as well. And on on the back of the card, it tells physicians exactly, in, in our eMERGE, and our uh, eMERGE physicians use it all the time when any of our patients show up, um, it shows them exactly what to do for major bleeds for von Willebrand disease of, of every type, um, including type three, and for hemophilia. So they found it very, very helpful. Um, and I also, when I'm working in eMERGE, I'm able to tap the shoulder of some of our uh, ER physicians and say, you know, do you think that woman in the gynae room that's bleeding heavily and talks about her family members who've uh, bled heavily and had uh, very serious complications in their deliveries, do you think we should take a couple of blue tubes and send them off to, uh, to our Kingston lab and maybe just test for von Willebrands? And on occasion, we have come up with patients, so they're more and more um, uh, alert to try to pick up these things. Um, there's, uh, I, I might be a triage if anyone comes in there, and I make sure that you get prompt treatment, I'll take you right in. And um, this is our um, favorite ER physician, or one of our favorite, I shouldn't say exactly the favorite, but, uh, <laughs> but he uh, and Lisa Thibault, who's my colleague, and we're just standing outside the gynae room, which is where we um, spend our time looking after any of our patients that happen to show up in eMERGE, and occasionally one shows up when I'm at work. So then, of course, the eMERGE physicians say, Cher, you just go look after her and tell me what you did. But I'm trying to make sure that they know exactly what to do. So uh, that's it. Thank you very much. Hi there. My name is Michelle Schulzberg. I'm uh, currently a hemostasis fellow at St. Michael's Hospital, and I'm directly mentored by Doctors Jerry Title and also by Dr. Bernadette Garvey. But I think it's important for me to mention that I'm also um, mentored quite closely by many people that are in this room Drs. Paula James, Drs. David Lilly Crapp, Molly Warner, Kathy Hayward, um, Margaret Rand. And of course, I'm also mentored by our excellent nursing team at St. Michael's Hospital, led by Georgina Floros. So I just really want to stress that it's really important for a young physician to have great mentors, and I'm very lucky. So I'm going to present um, an emergency case of a patient of ours at St. Mike's who had type three von Willebrand's disease. So this patient is a 36 year old Nelly Gravita female. Um, she has a very long standing history, well known to our clinic for type three von Willebrand's disease. And at St. Michael's Hospital, we have a very large uh, comprehensive bleeding disorders program. 
Her baseline levels reveal a VWF antigen of less than 5%, a Rickoff of less than 6%, and a factor VIII of 4%. And her baseline hemoglobin is 136 with a normal MCV. She's uh, sort of off and on iron replacement. In terms of her bleeding history, she developed heavy menstrual bleeding at the onset of menarche, and that's been stressed many times today with regards to the importance of it presenting with the very first period. She was diagnosed, in fact, with uterine fibroids in 2008, so again, patients with bleeding disorders can present with gynecologic abnormalities. She underwent a laparoscopic hysterectomy in 2008 with her ovaries left in situ. This is because she, in fact, had a lack of response to hormonal therapy and to antifibrinolytic therapy, and also because the patient was very resistant to targeted prophylaxis with VWF factor VIII concentrate. She was just not comfortable with regularly infusing her herself. In 2010, she developed a right-sided hemorrhagic ovarian cyst, and she was treated with Humate P then. And when I first met her, because I started at St. Michael's in my hemostasis fellowship in July 2011, I met her in November 2011. She developed a shoulder injury when she got up after kneeling underneath uh, her living room table and banged her shoulder, and she required Humate P for a few days for a very significant hematoma in the area. Um, this slide is just to reveal that she does have a history of an appropriate response to Humate P. And this was in the perioperative period around the time of her laparoscopic hysterectomy in 2008. So the bright red line represents her factor VIII, the sort of maroon line is her Rickoff, and the greenish line is her antigen level. And the big red arrows represent the time where she was actually bolused with Humate P. So she does have a good response to this concentrate. March 5, 2012, this patient presented to the emergency room at St. Michael's Hospital with severe right lower quadrant abdominal pain. The patient was very appropriately vocal and said, I'm a patient with type 3 von Willebrand's disease. I need Humate P. Please contact the nurse or doctor from the Bleeding Disorders Program here at St. Michael's. Unfortunately, no one listened. Her hemoglobin then was 130, and as I said, her baseline was 136. She had a CT scan that was done to investigate the cause of her right lower quadrant abdominal pain, and it actually revealed a very complex hemorrhagic cyst, and there's an area of hyperdense um, contrast that indicates that she has active hemorrhage in the area, and she also has mild to moderate hemoperitoneum as well. So this was documented and conveyed to the emergency room physician. The emergency room physician appropriately contacted the gynecology team. Unfortunately, the patient did not receive Humate P. She was sent home with analgesia at 4 p.m. on that day, and she was told to return to the emergency room if her pain worsens. So not necessarily something that would be inappropriate for one who does not have a bleeding disorder. On March 7th, at 1.44 in the morning, she returned to the emergency room with worsening abdominal pain, nausea, and vomiting. And it's important to say that the patient, in fact, did not think to con it's not that she did not think, she wasn't capable of actually calling our bleeding disorders nurse, whom she regularly actually has contact with, because she explained that she was just feeling so unwell that she wasn't thinking straight. When she presented, she was hemodynamically stable. She did not have any orthostatic changes in her vital signs. An abdominal ultrasound was repeated that revealed, again, this hemorrhagic cyst that was slightly larger than it was as documented on the CT scan done just a few days before. And this was the trend of her hemoglobin uh, this time. So they said her baseline hemoglobin is about 136, and you can see that on the March 5th level. March 7th at 1.55 a.m., her hemoglobin was falling. It was in the range of the 90s. A few, um, you know, about eight hours, no, 12 hours later, um, it had dropped further. And now she was sort of hovering around 85 grams per liter. At 11 p.m., um, I was actually contacted by the resident who was covering the hematology service. I was actually covering for hematology. Um, 
and the resident told me the entire story, and this was the first time that we had been made aware of the patient. Um, we promptly initiated treatment with Humate P, and she received this treatment for three consecutive days. Thankfully, she very rapidly improved, and she actually did not require any additional blood products, and she was discharged home three days later with oral iron supplementation. So what are the lessons that we have learned from this case? The point of bringing up this case is not to point a finger to our gynecology colleagues, because I think that this just simply represents a system failure, because the patient was seen by numerous physicians and many nurses, and um, actually the largest Canadian bleeding disorder site. Um, so one would think that uh, everyone would be educated and would know what to do with a patient who has a bleeding disorder, but this is obviously not the case. Um, I think that also the physicians and nurses who were involved in our case were probably excessively reassured by the stable hemoglobin. Um, and so the approach to a patient with a bleeding disorder must be different. We should not be reassured by a stable hemoglobin. When we have a patient with a bleeding disorder and we suspect bleeding, I do feel, and I know everyone in the room would agree with me, that this behooves targeted therapy. And I will also say that, as Maya Angelou explains, when people show you who they are, you should believe them. Uh, people do know themselves much better than you do. And this is particularly true of a patient with a bleeding disorder because they have been educated from the moment that that diagnosis was made to notify medical personnel of their condition for their own safety. Uh, the intervention in this case is education. I think that that's the key. So a discussion was had between the head of the emergency department and Dr. Title, who is the director of the Bleeding Disorders Program, and he reiterated the importance of involving staff from, bleeding dis from the Bleeding Disorders Clinic as soon as a patient presents to the emergency room. And we should also educate other physicians and nurses with regards to the safety and efficacy of targeted therapy for a patient with a bleeding disorder. Most of the time, the treatment is fairly simple. These patients have something missing, and we just need to give them something to replace it with. Thank you very much. So that concludes the session for this morning, uh, and, and what awaits us is a, a cold lunch. I just want to say uh, one, uh, one or two sentences to summarize a little bit of what we've said and what we've witnessed today. We've heard discussions on the diagnostics in the last session, a bit of a perspective on where we are and where we're going, uh, issues about pregnancy, iron deficiency, and we've heard case studies that tell us that we still have a ways to go. And I think with the advent of Code Rouge and with education uh, aimed at both patients and physicians, uh, there's hope that things will get better.